If you clicked on this video, you must be in a sour mood. If you weren't before, I'm sure you are now. Acids make things taste sour, but you wouldn't ever want to taste a super acid. Super acids are these crazy strong acids that yeet molecules apart because they protonate things which you wouldn't typically think of as bases. You've heard of methane before, CH4. Carbons can only have four bonds, right? <laughs> Wrong! Some of these acids are so strong that they can even protonate methane to CH5+. Traditionally, a super acid is defined as anything that's stronger than sulfuric acid, although this is a matter of semantics, whether or not it's a super acid depends on what your defining criteria are. Sulfuric acid is pretty strong and it can catalyze a lot of different reactions. The pKa of acids is typically solvent dependent, but I'm just going to give an example for each one here. Sulfuric acid has a pKa of 2.8, it's a really strong acid, and it has two OH groups, that means both of them can act as acids. However, only the first acid is a super acid. When sulfuric acid is used as a strong acid, it's because it's protonating things that don't normally want to be protonated. You can use sulfuric acid in tons and tons of reactions in organic chemistry, but because it's not a very strong super acid, I think we're going to have to be a little bit more harsh. Sulfuric acid, you can go right into D tier. The one nice thing about sulfuric acid is it's a liquid that you can handle, and it's very easy to make and get available. So that's the only thing going in sulfuric acid's favor. Overall, it's just not that strong of an acid, not compared to some of the ones on this list anyway. One of the things you can do to sulfuric acid though is mix it with sulfur trioxide, and that makes what's known as oleum. Oleum also can be referred to as fuming sulfuric acid, as when you open it, it fumes. It doesn't fume as much as pure sulfur trioxide, which is absolutely terrifying. It instantly turns black because it's forming pyrosulfuric acid. You usually only see oleum used in these really old syntheses that really old chemists used to do, and for that reason, I think we can start calling oleum boomer's acid. Because the oleum forms a complex between the sulfuric acid and the sulfur trioxide, forming pyrosulfuric acid, this becomes such a strong acid that it can even protonate sulfuric acid. So oleum is clearly a better super acid than sulfuric acid. It can catalyze all sorts of interesting reactions, but it fumes and it's pretty scary to work with. So oleum's pretty decent. I think we can put it into like C tier. It's definitely better than sulfuric acid, but there's some other ones on here that are definitely going to be ranked higher than oleum is. The next super acid is fluorosulfuric acid. This one's a little bit terrifying to look at because it's literally made by treating sulfur trioxide with HF. That's right, dissolving bodies HF, that's scary acid. Fluorosulfuric acid has a pK of minus 10. That's a very, very strong acid. And this compound is a liquid which can also be used for all sorts of acid-mediated reactions. Believe it or not, this is highly toxic. Who could have guessed? This stuff is pretty terrifying to work with. It only has a boiling point of 165, which is pretty low. And I have never worked with this, nor do I ever have the desire to work with this. Fluorosulfuric acid, you can go into B tier for, boy, I think I'm gonna die. Now what can happen is you can start mixing these with each other and you start getting some crazy stuff happen. Sometimes you can mix the two chemicals. Sometimes you have to just take inspiration from one chemical and apply it to the other. But one of the things that you can do is you can mix fluorosulfuric acid with antimony pentafluoride. This forms a mixture known as magic acid. Magic acid was something discovered by George Ola, and he had this demo at a Christmas party where he showed his grad students that he could dissolve a candle with it. That's right, this is such a strong acid that it will protonate the alkanes in a candle. You can also do all sorts of chemistry with it. It's a very strong acid, so that means it's good for chemical reactions but the fact that it can protonate alkanes is just mind-boggling. In fact, you can even protonate methane with this. Methane, innocent methane, CH4, now it's CH5+. You can tell your chemistry teacher the next time you accidentally draw a pentavalent carbon atom, hey, actually, George Ola could do it. He won a Nobel Prize. So maybe instead of giving me a zero on this quiz, I should actually get an 11 out of 10. Thank you very much. Magic acid, this is gonna go right into S tier. Is it practical to handle? Absolutely not. I would not wanna handle magic acid ever, but it's a very strong acid. If you can protonate methane, you have to go into S tier. Plus, I mean, both of these have an S in them, so that's also appropriate. We also have fluoroantimonic acid. This is another super acid, similar acid strength. I didn't mention that the pK of magic acid is so high that it's hard to measure, and you have to start doing these dumb chemistry explanations to even try and articulate how acidic they are. If you stop being able to use pKa's under traditional senses, I don't think that that's very useful for most people, so I'm not even going to go into weird Hammett acidity parameters. You don't need to know about that. Fluoroantimonic acid, though. This is another crazy strong one. It's made by mixing HF and antimony pentafluoride, also terrifying, and this one's also capable of protonating methane. One of the cool things you can do with this is if you have like an alkane such as isobutane, 
you can just protonate the CH and make the tert butyl carbocation and hydrogen gas. So this is so acidic, it will protonate one of the hydrogens of the alkane and make hydrogen gas. That is terrifying, right into S tier. Here we have one of my favorite super acids, fluoroboric acid. Oftentimes this is drawn as HBF4, and the nice thing about this one is it's commercially available as a solution in diethyl ether. This just protonates the diethyl ether and that forms a more stable complex, and that prevents the HF from being liberated and completely destroying your glassware. HF hates glass. If you ever put HF in glass, it'll etch it. So HBF4, it's a strong acid, but it's not overwhelming. When you add it to stuff, unless you have a base in there that's like really easily protonated, it's normally pretty tame when you quench stuff with it. This is one of those like, you just add it in, you get a color change, nothing crazy happens. It's not one of those pff, 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 reactions where every single drop is making you question why you even went into chemistry. Fluoroboric acid has a pKa of minus 0.4, at least in water, but it's still a super acid, even though it might not follow the definition of being more acidic than sulfuric acid. This one's really convenient to handle. This would be my super acid of choice if I was doing most chemical reactions. And so for that reason, I'm gonna put it into A tier. It's not as strong of an acid as these other ones, but it's very useful and it's A-OK -okay with me. What's not A-OK -okay, though is perchloric acid. This is another boomer acid because it used to be used a lot in the past. Perchloric acid is just made by protonating perchlorate with sulfuric acid and then distilling off the perchloric acid. However, the downside of perchloric acid is a lot of perchlorates are explosive because that chlorine does not want to be chlorine with four oxygens connected to it. It wants to be chloride. So it will give its oxygen away very readily. It's a potent, potent oxidizer. A lot of the time you'll have safety training to tell you specifically not to work with perchloric acid, and that's because it explodes stuff. Now, unfortunately, it has a really low pKa of minus 15. So this is a really useful acid. It's actually pretty good, especially considering how easy it is to make perchlorate electrochemically. So for that reason, I think we're gonna have to put perchlorate in like C tier. It's a really good acid, but it makes things go boom, which if you're working in the lab, you do not want things to go boom. It also makes sense. C for perchloric. The next acid here is triflic acid. This one might remind you of sulfuric acid as well as fluorosulfuric acid. The difference here is triflic acid is less volatile. It has a boiling point of 162 degrees, but this is still a terrifyingly strong acid. During my research, I was working with this to protonate this complex I was working with, and every single drop would go into the solvent as the solvent's instantly refluxing from the heat of the reaction produced when this protonates stuff. This is a very strong acid, and when they ship it to you, it's stored in ampules. Glass ampules are just sealed, they're completely in glass, and that prevents any moisture or any other undesired reactions from happening. Now the problem is, if you get 100 grams of this in an ampule, you're not gonna use 100 grams all at once in all likelihood, so you have to store it in something. So basically, because this is a super acid, it will also protonate alkanes. So even if you have a cap that's made of like polyethylene or polypropylene, eventually it cracks and breaks because this is a super acid. It will protonate the crap out of anything. So every time I used this, I would store it in a bottle and after a month or so, I would just have to replace the cap on my bottle because it would get destroyed. Even though I would choose the most inert caps with a Teflon liner, didn't matter. It would get protonated because super acids are no joke. This is a very strong reagent and I would not recommend working with this unless you're really well trained. Triflic acid is cool, but when you add it to stuff, it's very exothermic. I think this one can probably go into A tier, or why don't we put it between A tier and B tier, because it's worse than fluoroboric acid, but better than fluorosulfuric acid. Actually, I know what we can do. A few of you have complained that I don't use all the tiers in these tier lists, so why don't we do this? We'll move everything down a tier, even though we won't have any more C for chloric. This next acid is a little bit unconventional. Normally when you have an acid, you have an H plus that's fully liberated. You might have an OH that's just dying to give its H away. But triphlytic acid is a carbon acid. This poor carbon has three trifluoromethane sulfonyl groups connected to it. And that's just pulling the electron density away from that carbon. It's dying to be an anion. And so that makes this H really acidic. This has a pK of minus 18.6, which makes it one of the strongest acids on here. And occasionally you'll see it used, but it's still a pretty obscure acid amongst organic synthesis. So this can be used as a strong acid. It was reported in 1987, but it still hasn't seen a ton of use. So for that reason, I think we can put it into like B tier because it's a very strong acid. It just hasn't been used very much yet. 
but it's very strong. Don't get me wrong. I haven't mentioned it at this point, but if something goes up or down a unit on the PKA scale, let's say we go from minus two to minus three, that's 10 times stronger of an acid. So something that has a PKA of zero compared to something that has a PKA of minus six is a lot less acidic because something with a PKA of minus six is 10 to the six times more acidic. That's literally a million times more acidic. So for reference, hydrochloric acid has a pKa of minus 6.3. That means that triphlytic acid is 12.3 pKa units more acidic than hydrochloric acid. That means that it's a trillion times more acidic than hydrochloric acid. Just let that sink in for a minute. This is a trillion times more acidic than stomach acid. That's crazy. Next we have bis triflamidic acid. This one's a little bit more common. This is a nitrogen containing acid. Same sort of deal as the last one. These two sulfonyl groups just suck the electron density away from the nitrogen. The nitrogen's just dying to be an anion. This one's often used in the preparation of various inorganic salt complexes as it's a fairly non-reactive counter ion. Inorganic chemists want to study stuff, and if their complexes are decomposing, they can't study it. And if they can't study it, it's hard to get grants. So for that reason, they're going to be using anions that aren't very reactive, such as the bis anion. The pKa of bis acid is roughly minus 12, at least in dichloroethane, but in acetonitrile, its pKa is close to zero. Different solvents have drastically different effects on pKa's, so a really low pKa in one solvent doesn't mean that it'll be as low in another solvent, because it depends on a number of factors. So bis acid, it's useful, but oftentimes you have to prepare this yourself. You can't just buy it always, at least for lab work. So for this reason, I think we'll put it into C tier. It could be commercially available to some people, but those people are forking out a lot of money for this stuff. We have two acids left. Let's start with this carburane acid. This is just one of many different carburanes that exist, and carburanes are very acidic. These things possess pKa's well below minus 20, and that means that they are crazy strong acids. It's a bit hard to see what this looks like here, so here's a video of what this actually looks like when it's rotating. This will look pretty cursed to you, because this carbon is connected to five borons and an H. There is no way that that proton wants to stay on there. It is dying to leave. And boron normally forms three bonds, and each of these borons also has five bonds plus a sixth bond to the chlorine. This is crazy, crazy cursed. Super acids are often studied by people who get grants to study them. That might sound kind of dumb to non-scientists, but that's more or less the way this works. And believe it or not, some carburanes are being studied as potential motifs to include in drugs in the future. I sure hope that none of those are super acids, otherwise we could have a bad time. These things have been proposed as catalysts for hydrocarbon cracking, as super acids can protonate alkanes, which I mentioned earlier. This is going to also have to go right into S tier. Last but not least, we have this pentacyanocyclopenadiene. This is another extremely cursed looking molecule, and it's another carbon acid. This is our third carbon acid on the tier list. And this one's not as well known as the others. This one has an estimated aqueous pKa of minus 11, and it was only prepared as a free acid in 2004. Now, while I've drawn the hydrogen sticking off of this carbon here, in reality, this forms like a polymer where the hydrogen is protonating the nitrogen of the nitriles. So this doesn't even stick on where you'd expect it to be. This just forms a long chain of these five-membered rings, which are called cyclopenadienes. And when they're deprotonated, they get called a cyclopenadienide or cyclopenadienyl anion. The one nice thing about these anions is they're really weakly coordinating. And this is a reason why inorganic chemists would sometimes use them. So this is another crazy strong acid. It doesn't even stay where it belongs. So for that reason, we can put it into S tier. I hope you're not in as much of a sour mood as when we started this tier list. And if you want to keep me from being sour, you better subscribe or else I'll protonate you. Thanks for watching, and I hope you have a super day.